Tilly's first again. Harry Potter adding second this time. Mmm. Oh, yeah. Ooh, hitting those notes. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> this is a high school performance. A high school perf <laughs> performance of this song. Uh. <laughs> hey, everybody. Hey, Nana. Give us a roll call. Uh. Uh, I, I'm gonna let this roll out. Make it stop! Nathan's there. Hi, Tasha. Tasha's back! Timon! You're back. Okay, I'm gonna stop this. Hey, everybody, welcome to Kant's Corner with John Reedsley, where I go and read an hour of pa Harry Potter every day for you, to distract you, to connect with you, to make you laugh. Um, I'm very happy you're here. A couple of things everybody's already heard, but in case you're just tuning in, I haven't read the books. I've only seen two or three of the movies. Don't remember anything from them. Uh, I read all the comments afterwards. No spoilers, no hints. Uh, even if sometimes I ask a question, what's the deal with this? Don't answer it if it's a spoiler, okay? Um, I, I'm going to have a little Q&A interaction session with you at the end. Uh, there's uh, Jameson, and um, I save all of these on YouTube. Afterwards, so if you want to catch up, go into my uh, my li link in my bio to catch up. Don't forget to clap for the nurses. Alana Wright, who's also in the chat, she's a nurse. She's, she's watching this on her break, I think, today. Uh, and other nurses are joining. So if you're there, hello. Thank you so much for what you're doing. Here's a couple of new things. I will be... If, if, if I am in the middle of a chapter or in the, in the middle of a scene... I will finish that scene, so I will go longer than 60 minutes. I'll log off and then log back on, um, on live, because I don't like ending in the middle of these things and then picking it up. It, it loses some of the tension, it loses some of the, the story. So I'll be going a little longer, I won't be going 90 minutes or anything like that, but just to finish off whatever section we're in. Um, I'll also, also be throwing different questions, random questions at you, in between different sections. They won't be Harry Potter related, but I'm just interested in... Some, some more interaction and hearing your thoughts on different things. Okay, a crazy thing just happened that really, really made me happy that I'm going to reveal to you. So I, uh, there was a knock on the door, and in my mind I was like, who is this? Who's coming to our house and bringing Rona into the house? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm walking downstairs, and Mark's filming me. I open the door, and Lois, who I, I, I hope she's currently in the chat, um, she was at the door, and she gave me a whole box of cupcakes, beer, butter, cupcakes. Okay, butter beer. Uh, so butter beer. Sorry, butter beer uh, cupcakes. It's incredible. It made me so happy. Uh, so here's the description of what they are, and I haven't tried them yet. I'll be trying them for the first time on the screen. Uh, so they are brown sugar cupcake with toffee bits, filled with butterscotch pudding, topped with salted butterscotch sauce, and then a salted butter and cream soda frosting. And they have little lightning bolt sprinkles. How incredible is that? Lois, you are the best. Thank you so much. So here I go. I'm going to try this. And she, she gave me like 10 of them. <laughs> she gave me 10 of them. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Lois, this is incredible. This is incredible, Lois. Thank you so much. Ah, oh, best, most invigorating uplifting gift ever. All right. We're going to get to the reading. I know I took five minutes up here, but Lois, you are the best. Oh, man, that was so good. Oh, I can't wait to finish that. My goodness. I was just going to sit here for an hour and I can't even bite into it. <laughs> oh, this is torture. I'm torturing myself. I had a whole one. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, Mark's here. I have a trusty Harry Potter <laughs> advisor, helper. Dexter's here off in the corner. I'll bring him to, to screen so you can see him. And we'll get started. We are in the middle of a Quidditch match. The opposing uh, Slytherin team has Nimbus 2001 um, rods or broomsticks um, uh, supplied by Lucius Malfoy. He paid for them to have these great brooms. And uh, currently the, the, the bludger that's... Um, 
the, the ball that flies through the air and tries to knock people up, is targeting Harry. Fred and George are, have asked, to, uh, have said, okay, here's the tactic. He says, no, stay away from me. I can handle it. You need to focus on other things. I will take care of this bludger. I don't know how he's going to do it, but um, it's, uh, the, the t I, can't even, I can't even focus on what's happening because I just don't want to bite into it again. <laughs> okay, and again, I'll be going a bit longer. I know I take up time at the beginning, so it's not really a full hour I'm reading. So I'm going to go a bit longer and finish up whatever sections we're in, all right? Okay, we are on page 128 of this book, if you have this one. Uh, welcome, Kelsey, and welcome, welcome Amadiva. Here we go. Um, here we go. Okay, Harry. Listen, said Harry, as she came nearer and nearer. With you two flying round me all the time, the only way I'm going to catch the snitch is if it flies up my sleeve, said Harry. Go back to the rest of the team and let me deal with the rogue one. Don't be thick, said Fred. It will take your head off. Wood was looking from Harry to the Weasleys. Oliver, this is mad, said Alicia Spinett angrily. You can't let Harry deal with that thing on his own. Let's ask for an let's ask for an inquiry. If we stop now, we'll have to forfeit the match, said Harry. And we're not losing to Slytherin just because of a mud mad bludger. Come on, Oliver, tell them to leave me alone. This is all your fault, George said angrily to Wood. Get the snitch or die trying. What a stupid thing to tell him. Madam Hooch had joined them. Ready to resume play? She asked Wood. Wood looked at the determined look on Harry's face. All right, he said. Fred, George, you heard Harry. Leave him alone and let him deal with the bludger on his own. Oh, you're peacing out for a little sec, okay? Cool. Come back later, buddy. <laughs> the rain was falling more heavily now. On Madame Hooch's whistle, Harry kicked hard into the air and heard the telltale whoosh of the bludger behind him. Higher and higher Harry climbed. He looped and swooped, spiraled, zigzagged and rolled. Slightly dizzy, he nevertheless kept his eyes wide open. Like this. Wide, wide open. <laughs> Rain was speckling his glasses and ran up to his nostrils as he hung upside down. Oh gosh. Avoiding another fierce dive from the bludger. He could hear laughter from the crowd. He knew he must look very stupid. But the rogue bludger was heavy and couldn't change direction as quickly as he could. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have two different playlists. When it's a bit more intense, I'll put on the, the more intense music. <laughs> and when it's like nice scenes, I'll put on this music. Because this doesn't fit at all. <laughs> da -da 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 -da! I'm flying. I'm avoiding bludgers. Okay. <laughs> but the rogue bludger was heavy and couldn't change direction as quickly as he could. He began a kind of roller coaster ride around the edges of the stadium, squinting through the silver sheets of rain to the Gryffindor goalposts, where Adrian Pusey was trying to get past Wood. A whistling in Harry's ear told him the bludger had just missed him again. He turned right over and sped in the opposite direction. Training for the ballet training for the for the sorry, training for the ballet, Potter yelled Malfoy, as Harry was forced to do a stupid kind of twirl in mid-air to dodge the bludger. Off Harry fled, the bludger trailing a few feet behind him. And then, glaring back at Malfoy in hatred, he saw it, the golden snitch. It was hovering inches above Malfoy's left ear, and Malfoy, busy laughing at Harry, hadn't seen it. For an... <laughs> Dexter, he wants up. <laughs> Can you... he's, he's growling. He wants up. Um, for an agonizing, agonizing moment, Harry hung in mid-air, not daring to speed towards Malfoy in case he looked up and saw the snitch. Wham! He had stayed still a second too long. The bludger had... Oh, now he wants over here, too. Maybe just give him to me. So, so, sorry, everybody, interrupting this great story, because Dexter is interrupting everything. Hey, eh? Aren't you? Hey. Eh? Okay, here we go. He had stayed still a second too long. The bludger had hit him at last, smashed into his elbow, and Harry felt his arm break. Whoa! <laughs> Harry's arm broke! I thought he was, was going to be like the invincible Harry all the way through, like getting knocked over unconsciously and getting back up, but like an arm breaking, that's intense. Okay. Then it broke his neck. What?! <laughs> Dimly, dazed by the searing pain in his arm, he slid sideways on his rain-drenched broom, one knee still crooked over it, his right arm dangling useless at his side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
the bludger came pelting back for a second attack, this time aiming at his face. Harry swerved out of the way, one idea firmly lodged in his numb brain. Get to Malfoy. Th through a haze of rain and pain, he dived for the shimmering, sneering face below him and saw its eyes widen with fear. Malfoy thought Harry was attacking him. What the... He gasped, careening out of Harry's way. Harry took his remaining hand off his broom and made a wild snatch. He felt his fingers close on the cold snitch, but was now only gripping the broom with his legs. And there was a yell from the crowd below as he headed straight for the ground, trying hard not to pass out. Whoa, bad ass! <laughs> Harry is bad ass, just like, Bleh. wow, that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool, Harry. Okay, this is one of the first times I'm like, okay, Harry, I, I can see, I, I can see some of your badassery. <laughs> With a splattering thud, he hit the mud and rolled off his broom. His arm was hanging at a very strange angle. Ugh. Riddled with pain, he heard, as though from a distance, a good deal of whistling and shouting. He focused on the snitch, clutched in his good hand. Aha, he said vaguely. We've won. And he fainted. He came round, rain falling on his face, still lying on the pitch, with someone leaning over him. He saw a glitter of teeth. Oh no, not you, he moaned. <laughs> Doesn't know what he's saying, said Lockhart loudly. <laughs> to the anxious crowd of Gryffindors pressing around them. Not to worry, Harry. I'm about to fix your arm. No, said <laughs> Harry. I'll keep it like this. Thanks. <laughs> I would, I would do that, too. <laughs> he tried to sit up, but the pain was terrible. He heard a familiar clicking noise nearby. I don't want a photo of this, Colin, he said loudly. Lie back, Harry. No, lie back, Harry, said Lockhart soothingly. Okay. It's a simple charm I've used countless times. Why can't I just go to the hospital wing, said Harry, Harry through clenched teeth. Um, would. He should really... He should really, pro Professor, said a muddy wood, who couldn't help grinning even though his seeker was injured. Great capture, Harry. Really spectacular. Your best yet, I'd say. Smoke alarm just went off downstairs. Today is an eventful day. Okay, it just turned off. I think we're good. Thanks, Mark. Um, through the thicket of legs around him, Harry spotted Fred and George Wis Weasley wrestling the rogue bludger into a box. It was still putting up a terrific fight. Stand back, said Lockhart, who was rolling up his jade green sleeves. No, don't, said Harry weakly. But, Her but Lockhart was twirling his wand and a second later had directed it straight at Harry's arm. Yeah, what is happening today? It is pure chaos. <laughs> Dexter's running everywhere. Um, cupcakes and f fire alarms. It's uh, a magical day. It's chaotic good. <laughs> Your house reflecting how lit this chapter is. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice, Jameson. A strange and unpleasant sensation started at Harry's shoulder and spread all the way down to his fingertips. It felt as though his arm was being deflated. He didn't dare look at what, what, at what was happening. He had shut his eye, his face turned away from his arm, but his worst fears were realized. As the people above him gasped and Colin Creevy began clicking away madly, his arm didn't hurt anymore, but nor did it feel remotely like, like an arm. Okay, Lockhart screwed up. Ah, said Lockhart. Yes, well... That can sometimes happen, but the point is, the bones are no longer broken. <laughs> That's the thing to bear in mind. So, uh, Harry, just uh, toddle up to the hospital wing. Uh, Mr. Weasley, Miss Granger, would you escort him? And Madame Pomfrey will be able to uh, tidy you up a bit. As Harry got to his feet, he felt strangely lopsided. Taking a deep breath, he looked down at his right side. What he saw nearly made him pass out again. Poking out the end of his robes was what looked like a thick, flesh-colored rubber glove. He tried to remove his fingers. Nothing happened. Okay. Lockhart hadn't mended Harry's bones. He had removed them. <laughs> what an idiot! <laughs> <laughs> he 
He's such an idiot. Ugh. Madame Pomfrey wasn't at all pleased. Uh, who's Madame Pomfrey again? She's the nurse. Okay. You know what I'm going to do for next time? I'm going to make a list. And I'm going to have it here on my computer so I can just gaze down and do this quicker. Because every time I'm like, who is this? What's this ghost? Who's this person? So that, that'll speed it up for me. Right. She's the nurse. You should have come straight to me, she raged. You should have come straight to me, she raged, holding up the sad, limp remainder. Was that her voice? The remainder of what, half an hour before, had been a working arm. I can mend bones in a second, but growing them back. You will be able to, won't you? Said Harry desperately. I'll be able to, certainly. But it will be, a, but it will be painful, said Madame Pomfrey grimly, throwing Harry a pair of pajamas. You will have to stay the night. Hermione waited outside the curtain drawn around Harry's bed, while Ron helped him into his pajamas. It took a while to stuff the rubbery, boneless arm into a sleeve. How can you stick up for Lockhart now, Hermione? Eh? Ron called through a cur the curtain as he pulled Harry's limp fingers through the cuff. If Harry wanted deboning, he would have asked. Anyone can make a mistake, said Hermione, and it doesn't hurt any more, does it, Harry? No, said Harry. It doesn't do anything else either. As he swung himself onto the bed, his arm flapped pointlessly. <laughs> his head isn't without bones. Imagine a head without bones, though. That'd be funny. <laughs> Hermione and Madame Pomfrey came around the curtain. Madame Pomfrey was holding a large bottle of something labeled Skelligro. Of course they have that. You're in for a rough night. She said, pouring out a, a steaming beakerful and handing it to him. Regrowing bones is a nasty business. Regrowing bones is a nasty business. So was, so was taking the skelligro. It burned Harry's mouth and throat as it went down, making him cough and splutter. Still tut-tutting tut -tut about dangerous sports and inept teachers, Madame Pomfrey retreated, leaving Ron and Hermione to help Harry gulp down some water. We won, though, said Ron, a grin breaking across his face. That was some catch you made. Malfoy's face, he looked ready to kill. I want to know how he fixed that bludger. I want to know how he fixed that bludger, said Hermione darkly. Um, we can add that to the list of questions we'll ask him when we've taken the polyjuice potion, said Harry, sinking back onto his pillows. I hope it tastes better than this stuff. If it's got bits of Slytherins in it, if, it, if it's got bits of Slytherins in it, Got to be joking, said Ron. Hi, Dinah and Anita. Oh, yeah, by the way, Anita, tell Dan I, I took his criticism of my sweater yesterday and I put on a, a bright shirt. I hope, I hope it, 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 he likes it. I hope he likes this shirt. Do you like this, Dan? <laughs> the door of the hospital wing burst open at that moment. Filthy and soaking wet, the rest of the Gryffindor team had arrived to see Harry. Unbelievable flying, Harry, said George. I've just seen Marcus Flint yelling at Malfoy. Something about having the snitch on top of his head and not noticing. Malfoy didn't seem too happy. They had brought cakes, sweets, and bottles of pumpkin juice. They gathered around Harry's bed and were just getting started on what promised to be a good party when Madame Pomfrey came storming over, shouting... This boy needs rest. He's got 33 bones to regrow. Out. Out. And Harry was left alone with nothing to distract him from the stabbing pains in his limp arm. Stop interrupting the story, Dan. <laughs> uh, I don't know if this is going to work, but I, here, here's a question. Um, uh, who would you play in a movie about yourself? <laughs> Which actor would play you in a movie about yourself? I'm going to read this afterwards. Hours and hours later, Harry woke quite suddenly in the pitch blackness and gave a small yelp of pain. His arm now felt full of large splinters. For a second, he thought it was that which had broken him. Then, with a thrill of horror... With a thrill of horror? Can you have a thrill of horror? Be like, oh! Oh! <laughs> It's like kind of enticed by how terrifying it is. No! No! Something like that. Then, with a thrill of horror, he realized that something, someone was sponging his, his forehead in the dark. Get off! He said loudly. And then, Dobby! 
Yes! <laughs> the house elf's goggling tennis ball eyes were peering at Harry through the darkness. A single tear was running down his long, pointed nose. Harry Potter came back to school, he whispered miserably. Don't be warned and warned, Harry Potter. Ah, oh, sir, why didn't you heed, Dobby? Why didn't Harry Potter go back when he missed the train? Yeah, I, think that was, I think that was it. Harry heaved himself up on his pillow, pillows and pushed Dobby's sponge away. What are you doing here, he said. And how did you know I missed the train? Dobby's lip trembled and Harry was seized by a sudden suspicion. It was you, he said slowly. You stopped the barrier letting us through. Indeed, sir, yes, said Dobby, nodding his head vigorously, ears flapping. Dobby hid and watched for Harry Potter and sealed the gateway, and Dobby had to iron his hands afterwards. He showed Harry ten long, bandaged fingers. But Dobby didn't care, sir, for he thought Harry Potter was safe, and never did Dobby dream that Harry Potter would get to school another way. Was that, was that the voice? Yeah. yeah, that was it, right? Yeah. Again, I think the list would be helpful. Uh, he, he was rocking backwards and forwards, shaking his ugly head. Dobby was so shocked when he heard Harry Potter was back at Hogwarts. He let his master's dinner burn. Such a flocking Dobby never had, sir. Harry he slumped back into his pillow. You nearly got Ron and me expelled, he said fiercely. You'd better clear, clear off before my bones come back, Dobby, or I might strangle you. Dobby smiled weakly. Dobby's a little masochist. <laughs> <laughs> Dobby is used to death threats, sir. Dobby gets them five times a day at home. He blew his nose in a corner of the filthy pillowcase he wore, looking so <laughs> pathetic that Harry felt his anger ebb away in spite of himself. Why do you wear that thing, Dobby? he asked curiously. This, sir, said Dobby, plucking at the pillowcase. Tis a mark of the house elves' enslavement, sir. Dobby can only be freed if his masters present him with clothes, sir. The family is careful not to pass Dobby even a sock, sir. But then he would be free to leave the house forever. Dobby moped his bulging eyes and said suddenly, Harry Potter must go home. Dobby thought his bludger would be enough to make. Your bludger, said Harry, anger rising once more. What do you mean, your bludger? You made that bludger try and kill me. Not to kill you, sir. Never kill you, said Dobby shocked. Dobby wants to save Harry Potter's life. Better sent home, grievously injured, than remain here, sir. Dobby only wanted Harry Potter hurt enough to be sent home. Oh, is that all? said Harry angrily. I don't suppose you're going to tell me why you wanted to s me sent home in pieces. Ah, oh, if Harry Potter only knew. Dobby groaned, more tears dripping onto his ragged uh, pillowcase. If he knew what it means to us. Too lonely, the enslaved, us, us dregs to the magical world. Dobby remembers how it was when he, who must not be named, was at the height of his power, sir. We house elves were treated like vermin, sir. Of course, Dobby is still treated like that, sir. He admitted, he admitted, drying his face in the pillowcase. But mostly, sir, but mostly, sir, Life has improved for my kind since you triumphed over he who must not be named. Harry Potter survived, and the Dark Lord's power was broken, and it was a new dawn, sir. And Harry Potter shone like a beacon of hope for those of us who thought that dark days would never end, sir. Uh, Dr. Gollum Dobby. <laughs> Nathan hates Dolly. Dobby. And now, at Hogwarts, terrible things are to happen, and are perhaps happening already. And Dobby cannot let Harry Potter stay here now, that history is to repeat itself. Now that the Chamber of Secrets is open once more. Oh, I'm getting sick of his voice. Ugh. I, I, I might find something else, because his voice is hella annoying. <laughs>
<sighs> Dobby froze, horror struck, then grabbed Harry's water jug from his bedside table and cracked it over his own head. <laughs> Man, I, I'm feeling kind of just as annoyed at him as Harry is. <laughs> I'm like, just stop beating yourself up, you masochist. Both like and, ha like and hate Dobby at the same time. I feel the same way. Um, a second later, he crawled back onto the bed, cross-eyed, muttering, Bad Dobby! Very bad Dobby! So there is a chamber of secrets, Harry whispered, and did, did you say it's been opened before? Tell me, Dobby! He seized the elf's bony wrist as Dobby's hand inched towards the water jug. And also, tell me, tell me if that's the right voice or what I can change, because I'm finding it a little bit annoying. Uh, you probably are too, so tell me if there's anything I can change. But I'm not muggle-born. How can I be in danger from a chamber? Ah, uh, sir, ask no more. Ask no more of poor Dobby, stammered the elf, his huge eyes in the dark. Dark deeds are planned in this place, but Harry Potter must not be here when they happen. Go home, Harry Potter. Go home. Harry Potter must not meddle in this, sir. Tis too dangerous. Who is it, Dobby? Harry said, keeping a firm hold on Dobby's wrist to stop him hitting himself with a water jug again. Who's opened it? Who opened it last time? Dobby can't, sir. Dobby can't. Dobby mustn't tell, squealed the elf. Go home, Harry Potter, go home. I'm not going anywhere, said Harry fiercely. One of my best friends is Muggleborn. She'll be first in line if the chamber really has been opened. Dobby is annoying. That is why the voice you are doing is perfect. All right, sure. Harry Potter risks his own life for his friends, mo moaned Dobby in a kind of miserable ecstasy. <laughs> okay, Dobby. Okay, Dobby. You're getting a bit too much into yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so noble, so valiant. But he must save himself. He must. Harry Potter must not. Dobby suddenly froze, his bat ears quivering. Harry heard it too. There were footsteps coming down the passageway outside. Dobby must go, breathed the elf, terrified. There was a loud crack, and Harry's fist was suddenly clenched on thin air. Oh, he just disappears like that, crazy. He slumped back into bed, his eyes on the dark doorway to the hospital wing as the footsteps drew nearer. Next moment, Dumbledore was backing into the Dumbledore was backing into the dormitory, wearing a long woolly dressing gown and a nightcap. He was carrying one end of what looked like a statue. Professor McGonagall appeared a second later, carrying its feet. To get together, they heaved it onto a bed. Get Madam Pumphrey, whispered Dumbledore, and Professor McGonagall hurried past the end of Harry's bed, out of sight. Harry lay quite still, pretending to be asleep. He heard urgent voices, and then Professor McGonagall swept back into view closely followed by Madame Pomfrey, who was pulling a cardigan on over her nightdress. He heard a sharp intake of breath. What happened? Madame Pomfrey whis whispered to Dumbledore, bending over the statue on the bed. Another attack, said Dumbledore. Minerva found him on the stairs. There was a bunch of grapes next to him, said Professor McGonagall. We think he was trying to sneak up here to visit Potter. Harry's stomach gave a horrible lurch. Slowly and carefully, he raised himself a few inches so he could look at the statue on the bed. A ray of moonlight lay across its staring face. It was Colin Creevy. <sighs> Damn. Hmm. His eyes were wide and his hands were stuck up in front of him, holding his cam camera. Petrif uh, petrified? Petrified? whispered Madame Pomfrey. Yes, said Professor... Uh, Yes, said Professor McGonagall, but I shudder, shudder to think if Albus hadn't been on the way downstairs for hot chocolate, who knows what might have... The three of them stared down at Colin. Then Dumbledore leaned forward and prized the camera out of Colin's rigid grip. You don't think he managed to get a picture of his attacker? said Professor McGonagall, McGonagall eagerly. Dumbledore didn't answer. He prized open the back of the camera. camera. Good gracious, good gracious, said Madame Pomfrey. A jet of steam had hissed out of the camera. Harry, three beds away, caught the ac acrid smell of burnt plastic. Melted, said Madame Pomfrey wonderingly. All melted. What does, what does this mean, Albus? Professor McGonagall asked urgently. 
It means, said Dumbledore, that the Chamber of Secrets is indeed open again. Madame Pomfrey clapped a hand to her mouth. Professor McGonagall stared at Dumbledore. But Albus, surely... Who? The question, uh, the question is not who, said Dumbledore, his eyes on Colin. The question is how? And from what Harry could see of Professor McGonagall's shadowy face, she didn't understand this any better than he did. Okay, so last book, people were in on what was happening. This book, it's also a mystery to the teachers. And Dumbledore. So this is a book... This is a bit more exciting because this is an actual mystery to everybody involved. That's cool. I've never seen an entire Star Wars movie. Oh, we're talking about Star Wars. Maybe I'll read Star Wars books after this. No, I probably won't. <laughs> probably won't. Um, how about this? Uh, another question. What would you do if you had an extra $1,000 to spend on yourself? No bills, no nothing. Just 1000 bucks. Not a million. 1000 Chapter 11. The Dueling Club. Okay. Bunch of people doing this in a room against each other. Mm. Um, what is it again? Zamzi la bum bum. Something like that. Harry woke up on Sunday morning to find the dormitory blazing with winter sunlight and his arm reboned but very stiff. He sat up quickly and looked over at Colin's bed, but it had been blocked from view, view by the high curtains Harry had changed behind yesterday. Seeing that he was awake, Madame Pomfrey came bustling over with a breakfast tray and th then began bending and stretching his arms and fingers. All in order, she said, as, as he clumsily fed himself porridge left-handed. When you've finished eating, you may leave. Harry dressed as quickly as he could and hurried off to Gryffindor Tower, desperate to tell Ron and Hermione about Colin and Dobby, but they weren't there. Harry left to look for them, wondering where they could have got to and feeling slightly hurt that they weren't interested in whether he had his bones back or not. <laughs> As Harry passed the library, Percy Weasley strolled out of it, looking in far better spirits than last time they'd met. Oh, hello, Harry, he said. Excellent flying yesterday, really excellent. Gryffindor has just taken the lead for the House Cup. You earned 50 points. You haven't seen Ron or Hermione, have you? No, I haven't said Percy, his smile fading. I hope Ron's not in another girl's toilet. Harry for forced a laugh. Watched Percy out of... Oh, this is Percy. Not I was thinking it was um, Malfoy. Yeah, I was like, it sounds an awful lot like Malfoy. That's what I was reading as Malfoy. <laughs> okay, it's Percy. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Harry forced a laugh, watched Percy out of sight, and then headed straight for Moaning Myrtle's bathroom. He couldn't see why Ron and Hermione would be in there again. But after making sure that neither Filch nor any prefects were around, he opened the door and heard their voices coming from a locked cubicle. It's me, he said, closing the door behind him. There was a clunk, a splash, and a gasp from within the cubicle, and he saw Hermione's eyes peering through a keyhole. Harry, she said, you gave us such a fright. Come in. How's your arm? Fine, said Harry, squeezing into the cubicle. An old cauldron was perched on the toilet, and a crackling from under the rim told Harry they had lit a fire beneath it. Just probably just lit all the poop on fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because poop's funny. You yeah, poop's, poop's, poop's super funny. Just didn't light a fire. <laughs> <laughs> Conjuring up a portable, water, a portable waterproof fires was a specialty of Hermione's. Uh, Ron. We'd have come to meet you, but we decided to get started on the polyjuice, polyjuice portion. A potion, Ron explained, as Harry, with difficulty, locked the cubicle again. We've decided this is the safest place to hide it. We, um, Harry started to tell them about Colin, but Hermione interrupted. We already know. We heard Professor McGonagall telling Professor Flitwick this morning. That's why we decided we'd better get going. The sooner we get a confession out of Malfoy, the better, snarled Ron. Do you know what I, do, do you know what I think? He was in such a foul temper after the Quidditch, Quidditch match. He took it out on Colin. There's something else, said Harry, watching Hermione te tearing bundles of knot grass and throwing them into the potion. Dobby came to visit me in the middle of the night. Ron and Hermione looked up, amazed. Harry told them everything t Dobby had told them, or hadn't told them. Ron and Hermione listened with their mouths open. The Chamber of Secrets has been opened before, said Hermione. 
This settles it, said Ron in a triumphant voice. Lucius Malfoy must have opened the chamber when he was at school here. School here. And now he's told dear old Mal Draco how to, how to do it. It's obvious. Wish Dobby would have told you what kind of monster's in there, though. I want to know how come nobody's noted it, no noticed it sneaking round the school. Maybe it can make itself invisible, said Hermione, prodding leeches to the bottom of the cauldron. Or maybe it can disguise itself, pretend to be a suit of armour or something. I've read about chameleon ghouls. You've read too much, Hermione, said Ron, pouring dead lace wings on top of the leeches. He crumpled up the empty, empty lace wing bag and looked around at Harry. So Dobby stopped us getting on the train and broke your arm. Broke your arm, he, sh he shook his head. You know what, Harry? If he doesn't stop trying to save your life, he's going to kill you. Okay, sorry. Just, some of the voices got a little mixed up there for me. I keep on doing this as if I have, you know, real lenses on trying to... It, it, it just, uh, you know, I don't wear glasses. Those glass wearers of you. Do you keep on moving it around because of the position on your on your nose or because you're trying to see better? Because for me, it's like, it's weird. It feels weird. Ah, the news that Colin Creevy had been attacked and was now lying as though dead in the hospital wing had spread through the entire school by Monday morning. The air was suddenly thick with rumor and suspicion. The first years were now moving around the castle in tight-knit groups as though scared they would be attacked if they ventured forth alone. Ginny Weasley, who sat next to Colin Creevy in charms, was distraught. But Harry felt that Fred and George were going, to, were going the wrong way about cheering her up. They were taking it in turns to cover themselves with fur or boils and jump out at her from behind statues. <laughs> <laughs> they only stopped when Percy, apologetic about uh, with rage, told them he was going to write to Miss, Mrs. Weasley and tell her Ginny was having nightmares. Meanwhile, hidden from the teachers, a roaring trade in, in talismans, amulets, and other protective devices was sweeping the school. Neville Longbottom bought a large, evil-smelling green onion a pointed purple crystal, and a rotting newt tail before the other Gryffindor bo boys pointed out that he was in no danger. He was a pureblood, and therefore unlikely to be attacked. They went, for, they went for Filch first, Neville said, his round face fearful, and everyone knows I'm almost a squib. <laughs> he doesn't know anything. <laughs> in the second week of December, Professor McGonagall came around as usual, collecting names of those who would be staying at school for Christmas. I'm going to need some water. Harry, Ron, and Hermione signed her list. They had heard that Malfoy was staying, which struck them as very suspicious. The holidays would be the perfect time to use the polyjuice potion and try to worm a confession out of him. Unfortunately, the potion was only half finished. They still needed the bicorn horn and the boomslang skin. And the only place they were going to get them was from Snape's private stores. Harry privately felt he'd rather face Slytherin's legendary monster than have Snape catch him robbing his office. What we need, said Hermione briskly, as Thursday's afternoon double potions lesson loomed near, is a, is a diversion. Then one of us can sneak into Snape's office and take what we need. Harry and Ron looked at her nervously. I think I'd, be I think I'd better do the actual stealing, Hermione gr uh, continued in a matter-of-fact tone. You two will be expelled if you get in any more trouble, and I've got a clean record. So, all you need to do is cause enough mayhem to keep Snape busy for five minutes or so. Harry smiled feebly. Deliberately causing mayhem in Snape's potion class was about as safe as poking a sleeping dragon in the eye. Where is he? Let's get Dexter back in, in frame. I know, I don't know. Oh, there he is. Potion's lesson took place in one of the large du dungeons. Thursday afternoon's lesson proceeded in the usual way. Twenty cauldrons stood steaming between the wooden desks, on which stood brass scales and jars of ingredients. Snape prowled th through the fumes, making waspish remarks about the Gryffindor's work, while the Slytherin sniggered appreciatively. Draco Malfoy, who was Snape's favorite student, Oh, what? Come on, get out of here! kept flicking pufferfish eyes at Ron and Harry, who knew that if they retaliated, they would get detention faster than he could say, unfair. Harry's swelling solution was far too runny. 
but he had his mind on more important things. He was waiting for Hermione's signal, and he hardly listened as Snape paused to sneer at his watery potion. When Snape turned and walked off to bully Neville, Hermione caught Harry's eye and nodded. Harry ducked swiftly behind his cauldron, pulled one of Fred's filibuster fireworks out of his pocket, and gave it a quick prod with his wand. The firework began to fizz and sputter, knowing he had only seconds. Harry straightened up, took aim, and lobbed it in the air. It landed right on target in Goyel's cauldron. Goyel's potion exploded. Yes, I'm saying Goyel, deal with it. Showering the whole class. People shrieked as splashes of the swelling solution hit them. Malfoy got a faceful, and his nose began to swell like a balloon. Goyel blundered around, his hands over his eyes, which had expl which which had expanded, expanded, exploded, and expanded at the same time. I guess. <laughs> Typo. Which had expanded. Oh, expanded! Which had expanded to the size of size of dinner plates, while Snape was trying to restore calm and find out what happened. Through the confusion, Harry saw Hermione slip quietly out of the door. Silence! Silence! Snape roared. Anyone who has been splashed, come here for a deflating draught. When I find out who did, did, did this, Harry tried not to laugh as he watched Malfoy hurry forward, his head drooping with the weight of a nose like a smell, small melon. <laughs> as half of the class lumbered up to Snape's desk, desk some weighed down with arms like clubs, other unable to talk through gigantic puffed lips, Harry saw Hermione slide back into the dungeon, the front of her robes bulging. When, every had take, when everyone had taken a swig of antidote and the various swellings had subsided, Snape swept over to Goyel's cauldron and scooped out the twisted black remains of the firework. There was a sudden hush. If I ever find out who threw this, Snoop whispered. I shall make sure that person is expelled. Harry ranged his face into what he hoped was a puzzled expression. Snape was looking right at him, and the bell which rang ten minutes later could not have been more welcome. He knew it was me, Harry told Ron and Hermione, as they hurried back to moaning Myrtle's bathroom. I could tell... Hermione threw the new ingredients into the cauldron and began to stir feverishly. It'll be, it'll be ready in a fortnight, she said happily. Snape can't prove it was you, said Ron reassuringly, reassuringly to Harry. What can he do? Knowing Snape, something foul, said Harry, as the potion frothed and bubbled. Snoop, Snoop, Severus, Snoop. Yeah, Snoop's back. Oh, cool. Okay, there. Hermione surprised me. She's constantly going, and she did say herself, it's better to, you know, fight a monster or get caught or something like that than her parents dying. So she has, you know, her relationship, again, are more important than her doing the right, no, the not the right thing, the rule-abiding thing. Relationships over rules. I like that, Hermione. I like that kind of Hermione. A week later, Harry, Ron, and Hermione were walking across the entrance hall when they sm saw a small knot of people gather around the, the notice board, reading a piece of parchment that had just been pinned up. Seamus Finnegan and Dean Thomas beckoned them over, looking excited. They're starting a dueling club, said Seamus. First meeting tonight. I wouldn't mind dueling lessons. They might come in handy one of these days. What? What? You reckon Slytherin's monster can duel, said Ron, but he too read the sign with interest. Could be useful, he said Harry. He said to Harry and Hermione as they went into dinner. Shall we go? Harry and Hermione were all for it. So at eight o'clock that evening, they hurried back to the great hall. The long dining tables had vanished, and a golden stage had appeared along the wall, lit by thousands of candles floating overhead. The ceiling was velvety, velvety black once more and most of the school seemed to be packed beneath it, all carrying their wands and looking excited. I wonder who'll be teaching us, said Hermione, as they edged into the chattering crowd. Someone told me Flitwick was a dueling champion when he was young. Maybe it'll be him. As long as it's not, Harry began, but he ended on a groan. Gilderoy Lockhart was walking onto the stage resplendent oh what a good word <laughs> love that word resplendent in robes of deep plum and accompanied by none other than snoop 
wearing his usual black. This dude, Lockhart, he spends no doubt an hour in front of the... More than an hour in front of all his pictures of himself and the mirror every day. <laughs> Just talking to himself. Love it. Lockhart waved an arm for silence and called, Gather round! Gather round! Can everyone see me? Can you all hear me? Excellent. Now, Professor Dumbledore has granted me permission to start this dueling club, to train you all up in case you ever need to defend yourself, as I myself have done on countless occasions. For full details, see my published work. <laughs> let me introduce you... Let, let me introduce my assistant professor, Snape, said Lockhart, flashing a wild smile. He tells me he knows a tiny little bit about dueling himself and has sportingly agreed to help me with a short demonstration before we begin. Now, I don't want any of you youngsters to worry. You'll still have your potions, master, when I'm through with them. Never fear! <laughs> Wouldn't it be good if they finished each other off? Ron muttered in Harry's ear. <laughs> Uh, Snape's upper lip was curling. Harry wondered why Lockhart was still smiling. If Snoop had been looking at him like that, like that he, like that, he'd have been running as fast as he could in the opposite direction. Lockhart and Snape turned to face each other and bowed. At least Lockhart did, with much twirling of his hands. Whereas Snape jerked his hand, his head irritably. Then they raised their wands like swords in front of them. As you see. We are holding our wands in the acceptable combative position, Lockhart told the silent crowd. On the count of three, we will cast our first spells. Neither of us will be aiming to kill, of course. I wouldn't bet on that, Harry murmured, watching Snape baring his teeth. One, two, three! Both of them swung their wands up and over their shoulders. Snape cried, Expelliarmus! There was a dazzling flash of scarlet light, and Lockhart was blasted off his feet. He flew backwards off the stage, smashed into the wall, and slid down to a sprawl on the floor. Uh, Malfoy and some of the other Slytherins cheered. Hermione was dancing on tiptoes. Oh, do you think he's all right? She squealed through her fingers. Who cares? said Harry and Ron together. <laughs> Lockhart was getting unsteadily to his feet. His hat had fallen off and his wavy hair was standing on end. Well, there you have it, <laughs> he said, tottering back onto the platform. That was a disarming charm, as you see. I've lost my wand. Uh, thank you, Miss Brown. Yes, um, an excellent idea to show them that, Professor Snape, but if you don't mind my saying so, it was very obvious what you were about to do. If I had wanted to stop you, it would have been only too easy. However, I felt it would be instructive to let them see... Snape was looking murderous. Possibly Lockhart had noticed, but he said, Enough demonstrating! I'm going to come amongst you now and put you all in pairs. Uh, Professor Snape, if you'd like to help me. They moved through the crowd, matching up partners. Lockhart teamed Neville with Justin Finch Fletch Fletchley, but Snoop reached Harry and Ron first. Time to split up the dream team, I think, he sneered. <laughs> Weasley, you can partner Finnegan. Potter. Harry moved automatically towards Hermione. I don't, I don't think so, said Snape, smiling coldly. Mr. Malfoy, come over here. Let's see what you make of the famous Potter. And you, Miss Granger, you can partner Miss Bulstrode. Malfoy strutted over, smirking. Behind him walked a Slytherin girl who reminded Harry of a picture he'd seen in Holidays with Hags. <laughs> uh, she was large and square, and her heavy jaw jutted, aggr jutted aggressively. Okay, like that. Hermione gave her a weak smile, which she did not return. Oh, <laughs> she's intense. Face your partners, called Lockhart back in the platform, platform and bow. Harry and Malfoy barely inclined their heads, not taking their eyes off each other. One's at the ready, shouted Lockhart. When I count to three, cast your charms to disarm your opponent, only to disarm them. We don't want any accidents. One, two, three. Harry swung his wand over his shoulder, but Mal Malfoy had already started on two. 
His, his spell hit Harry so hard, he felt as though he'd been hit over the head with a saucepan. He stumbled, but everything still seemed to be working. And wasting no more time, Harry pointed his wand straight at Malfoy and shouted, Rictusempra! Rictusempra! Rictusempra. A jet of silver lightning hit Malfoy in the stomach, and he doubled up, wheezing. I said disarm only, sh uh, uh, shouted Lockhart in alarm over the heads of the battling crowds as Malfoy sank to his knees. Harry had hit him with a tickling charm, and he could barely move for laughing. Harry hung back with a vague feeling it would be unsporting to bewitch Malfoy while he was on the floor. But this was a mistake. Gasping for breath, Malfoy pointed his wand at Harry's knees, choked, <laughs> Terentalagra! And next second, Harry's legs had begun, began, begun to jerk around out of his control in a kind of quick step. Stop! Stop! Screamed Lockhart. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, Snoop took charge. Frenet incantantum! He shouted. Harry's feet stopped dancing. Malfoy stopped laughing, and they were able to look up. Uh, do not go look at that video. Everything. John, do not go look at that video. Everything will be ruined. Okay, I won't look at whatever vi video somebody suggested. A haze of greenish smoke was hovering over the scene. Both Neville and Justin were lying on the floor, panting. Ron was holding up an ashen-faced Seamus, apologizing for whatever his broken wand had done. But Hermione and Millicent Bulstrode were still moving. Millicent had Hermione in a headlock, and Hermione was whimpering in pain. Both their wands lay forgotten on the floor. Harry leapt forward and pulled Millicent off. It was difficult. She was a lot bigger than he was. Dear, dear, said Lockhart, skittering through the crowd, looking at the aftermath of the, du of the duels. Up you get, Macmillan. Careful there, Miss Fawcett. Pinch it hard. It'll stop bleeding in a second boot. <laughs> Lockhart. I think I'd better teach you how to block unfriendly spells, said Lockhart, standing flustered in the midst of the hall. He glanced at Snoop, whose black eyes glinted, and looked quickly away. Let's have a volunteer pair. Longbottom and Finch Fletchley, how about you? A bad idea, Professor Lockhart, said Snape, gliding over like a large and malevolent bat. <laughs> 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 Yeah, when he's, like, walking or gliding, he's just, like, constantly, like, <laughs> I'm here and I'm evil. <laughs> Longbottom causes devastation with the simplest spells. We'll be sending what's left of Finch Fletchley up to the hospital wing, hospital wing in a matchbox. Neville's round pink face went pinker. How about Malfoy and Potter? Said Snape with a twisted smile. Excellent idea said Lockhart, gesturing Harry and Malfoy into the middle of the hall as the crowd backed away to give them room. Now, oh, now, Harry, said Lockhart, when Draco, when, Draco, when Draco points his wands at you, you do this. He raised his own wand, attempted a complica complicated sort of wiggling action, and dropped it. Snoop smirked as Lockhart quickly picked it up, saying, Whoops! <laughs> yeah, yeah, my wand is a little overexcited. <laughs> Snape moved closer to Malfoy, bent down, and whispered something in his ear. Malfoy smirked, too. Harry looked nervously up at Lockhart and said, Professor, could you show me that blocking thing again? Scared? No, scared, muttered Malfoy, so that Lockhart couldn't hear him. You wish, said Harry out of the corner of his mouth. Lockhart cuffed Harry merrily on the shoulder. Just do what I did, Harry. What? Drop my wand? But Lockhart wasn't listening. Three, two... One, go, he shouted. Malfoy raised his wand quickly and bellowed, Serpent Sortia! The end of his wand exploded. Harry watched, aghast, as a long black snake shot out of it, fell heavily onto the floor between them and raised itself, ready to strike. There were screams as the crowd backed swiftly away, clearing the floor. Don't move, Potter! Said, said Snape lazily, clearly enjoying the sight of Harry standing motionless, eye, eye to eye with the, with the angry snake. I'll get rid of it. Allow me, shouted Lockhart. He b <laughs> this guy is like, ugh. He's the worst. He brandished his wand at the snake and there was a loud bang. The snake, instead of vanishing, 
flew ten feet into the air and fell back onto the floor with a loud smack. Enraged, hissing furiously, it slithered straight towards Justin Finch Fletchley and raised itself again. Fangs exposed, poised to strike. Harry wasn't sure what made him do it. He wasn't even aware of deciding to do it. All he knew was that his legs were carrying him forward as though he was on casters, and that he shouted stupidly at the snake, Leave him! And mirac miracu miraculously, inexplicably, the snake sl slumped to the floor, docile as a thick black garden hose, its eyes now on Harry. Harry felt the fear drain out of him. He knew the snake wouldn't attack anyone now. Though how he knew it, he couldn't have explained. He looked up at Justin, grinning, expecting to see Justin looking relieved or puzzled or even grateful, but certainly not angry and scared. What do you think you're playing at? He shouted, and before Harry could say anything, Justin had turned and stormed out of the hall. Snoop stepped forward, waved his wand, and the snake vanished in a small puff of black smoke. Snape, too, was looking at Harry in an unexpected way. It was a shrewd and calculating look, and Harry didn't like it. He was also dimly aware of an ominous muttering around the halls. Then he felt a tugging on the back of his ro robes. Come on, said ha Ron's voice in his ear. Move, come on. Ron steered him out of the hall. Uh, okay, I'm going to end there. That's a good, end, good, good place to end, because that's over. Okay, we, we got a good place to end. Wow, good stuff. Harry breaking his arm, that the kid getting turned to stone, this old dual action. Uh, yeah, he's got some kind of power over snakes or something. Yeah, interested to hear what that's all about. Uh, what's your favorite uh, part that we've read until now? Not coming up. What's your favorite fun? Have fun with the comments today, John. Ha 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 ha. Okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not in Gryffindor. Uh, no, I am in Gryffindor. Sorry, I thought you said the... the